Hi everyone, so this is our first video of content and we're going to go over a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to give you many of these in this semester, um, but here's where you can find them. And this is going to be the first one here uh, called Week 1 Lecture. And in this video and PowerPoint presentation, we're going to go some, over some introductory topics in statistics, namely variables, study types, populations and samples, parameters and statistics, and some details about all those topics. Here we go. So as an introduction here, uh, I think a lot of us probably see and have an intuitive understanding of some statistics that are displayed to us in everyday life. For instance, uh, weather. Weather is forecasted based on very intense uh, statistical and mathematical models where data information uh, based on current variables such as pressure, wind, temperature, etc., where that information is used to learn about something in the future, right, to make predictions. And furthermore, here's another example of, of statistics based on weather, where information is displayed in a certain type of graph. This is called a bar graph. We'll eventually go over that. And you can convey a lot of information really quick. For instance, which type of phenomenon here seems to have maybe the largest number of fatalities? Well, this red graph, this red bar over here for flood seems to stick out, right? So some information is being conveyed there pretty quickly. Heat also seems to be uh, another phenomenon that has a lot of fatalities associated with it. So even without taking a statistics class, I assume that your average individual could see an image like this and be able to interpret it reasonably well. Another topic that is riddled with statistics are is the health field, and especially health and related with fatalities. And here, another basic graph, but it conveys a lot of information really quick. And certainly, if prescriptions or medication is administered in relation to some of these ailments before any drug is prescribed, those types of drugs need to be tested and their efficacy needs to be verified. And a lot of statistics is going to play a role into that. Lastly, my last example here, I don't know anything about this, but if you are a sports fan, certainly everything about sports has been dissected in terms of uh, stats for teams and players and different variables associated with each of those. For us in our class, we're going to be more focused on biological and natural science applications of statistics. And that's my cat. <laughs> and so a common facet of statistics is trying to find patterns or trends in information that's been gathered about something that you care about. And those patterns or trends aren't necessarily given in black and white, where those patterns and trends, if they exist, are sort of muddied or muddled with a lot of other information and needs to be dissected to be understood. And so I kind of like this graph, this little figure, but it's a little interesting as well, where there might be a signal, some decreasing trend, for instance, but that signal might be hard to visualize because it is obscured by other noise. And these are technical terms. And so data that is observed may not be so clear. What is that trend? Because there's a lot of other information that needs to be sifted through. In our class, we're going to focus on the statistical techniques to analyze data. And so that is the focus. We're going to try to have some interesting examples throughout the class, but this class is not necessarily all about watersheds or it's not all about um, fisheries, but we're going to use lots of examples from those topics to explore 
statistical analysis techniques. So let's talk about some variables and study types to get going here. We're going to mention variables a lot in our class. So this is important foundational stuff. A variable is a characteristic that you care about. And this variable can take on a value or be assigned a category. So that value can vary, right? Variable. That category may vary. And so we generally have two different types of variables. We've got quantitative, and you can probably guess the other one, qualitative. I usually say categorical, but we can say categorical and qualitative synonymously. A common variable would be sex, if we're just thinking in the binary sense there. Now, male or female, does that seem quantitative or does that seem qualitative? Because it's not numeric inherently, that is a qualitative or a categorical variable. Let's look at these variable types a little bit more detailed. So categorical data can be further defined as being nominal or ordinal. Nominal categorical data has no apparent order, whereas ordinal data does have a natural ordering. So for instance, you might think of categories like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. There is a natural order to arrange those categories. So those categories compose a variable that you might call class standing. Whereas categories with no order may be a variable like breed of dog. And there are different breeds of dogs, golden retriever, rottweiler, husky, chihuahua. There's no inherent order to list those breeds. So breed of dog would be a nominal variable. On the other side, where we have quantitative data, we have continuous or discrete. Continuous variables are generally measured and can take on decimals. So if you can have half of something, it's probably continuous. So for instance, the temperature. Temperature varies, right? It's measured, and you can have half of a degree Celsius, half a degree Fahrenheit. Discrete data is generally counted, so these are whole numbers. So how about the number of days that exceed 100 degrees? You would count the number of days that exceeded that temperature. So countable whole, whole numbers are discrete variables. Let's look at some examples. Continent of birth. List out the continents. There's no inherent order to those continents. So those would be, this would be a variable that is nominal. Sex, we've already discussed that. Species of rock. Ordinal examples. So size of car is the variable. Olympic medals is the variable. And the categories that compose them, there's a natural order to those. Big, medium, small bronze, silver, gold, and if you shuffle those categories, you kind of lose a little bit of the picture. So now that we've talked about categorical variables, let's look at quantitative variables. So these are all measured, right? Weight, height, cholesterol, those are all things that are measured. And whether your units are in imperial or metric, you can have half a pound, half a kilogram, half an inch, half a centimeter. So these are all measured and can take on decimal values. Discrete quantitative variable examples. These are all whole numbers. So things that are generally counted. So the number of species observed, number of marbles, number of trees, countable. So looking at this little tree here, the type of data that is being observed that you care about 
is going to determine the type of analysis that you can do with it. For instance, if you have a variable that you care about and it's a categorical variable, well, you can't take the average gold medal. You can't take the uh, average chihuahua, but you could count the number of chihuahuas or the number of bronze medals. Or you can obtain the proportion or percentage of chihuahuas or bronze medals. On the other side, if you have quantitative data, you could take, say, the average height or the median weight. So the type of data that you have is going to determine the type of analysis that you can do with it. And so that's going to play a common theme throughout our class. A couple displays here. I've displayed um, here are just a swath of numbers that appear to be continuous, right? There's decimals. This is just randomly generated information. You could make a graph with this data. Over here, this would be categorical data, where there are categories and they have been counted up. And so these are two different kinds of graphs. They accomplish a similar task, but again, the type of variable that was observed is going to determine sort of the analysis that's done with it. So this is called a histogram and it applies to quantitative data. We'll spend more time on that in the future. And this is a bar plot and it applies to categorical data. I would like to look at some more examples of variable types. I'm going to display here the variable and then right below it are the values or the categories that compose that variable. I'll write fishes in the Snake River. We've got different kinds of trout here. That appears to be categorical. Furthermore, there's no inherent order to these trout, and so this would be a nominal categorical variable. What about this one? Teacher rating. Unacceptable, poor, fair, good, excellent. Here we have another variable and it is composed of categories. So yes, it's categorical, but in this case it appears that the categories have a natural order to them. So that would be an ordinal categorical variable. What about this? What if we had teacher rating yet again, but of, instead of unacceptable, poor, fair, good, excellent, we have one, two, three, four, five. Now this one's kind of tricky because you might see these numbers and think, oh, quantitative, but this is actually still categorical because these numbers are not necessarily measured and they are not necessarily counted. These are values, yes, but they are representing an idea, a category, and they were not measured or counted. So tricky, tricky, even though you see numbers, it does not necessarily imply that those numbers compose a quantitative variable. Let's look at another one. Number of eggs in a bird's nest. Alrighty, alright. So this is number of, so these are being counted. So that's a quantitative variable that is discrete. Next, flow rate in cubic feet per second of the Smith River. A beautiful river up here in Northern California. Now this is flow rate, and this is a measurement, cubic feet per second. So that is quantitative, and because it's measured and you can have half of a cubic foot, that is a continuous quantitative variable. Got a few more for you. Number of cancerous lymph nodes in a patient. You're counting them up, so that's a discrete quantitative variable. What about U.S. Army rankings? 
I know I'm missing a few here, but I think these are some of the major rankings. There appears to be some order to those, right? So that's an ordinal categorical variable. What about blood type of a person? Well, that would be categories, right? So are, is there a particular order to them? Not necessarily. You can shuffle them up and it's just a list of blood types. So that would be a nominal categorical variable. Okay. Talking about variables, uh, we have some notation to discuss. Sometimes we like to abbreviate things, right? And we might abbreviate a variable with a letter. Especially when you're referring to it a lot, it can be handy. Often we use the letter Y, but you could use any letter, really. You might use the letter H to represent height. But generally, capital letters represent the variable. And lowercase letters would represent particular observations from that variable, such as lowercase y equals 13.2 meters. To backtrack for just a second, with the example of number of cancerous lymph nodes in a patient, I might call that equals y, capital Y. But I might say lowercase y equals zero. Okay, so the name of the variable next to these dots here boop, would have a capital letter, but the particular value or category would take on a lowercase letter. It's kind of a subtle point, but it is um, a nice organizational tool. So like I said, you could use any letter you want. If this was me, I might use the letter H to represent heights. Y also works pretty well. However, there's one letter you probably don't want to use, and that's the letter N, because N is generally reserved to represent sample size. And we'll talk about what sample size is in the near future. So we're talking about observations here just a little bit. And so I want to talk about observational units. An observational unit is the individual that is giving you the information for the variable that you care about. So for instance, if you are interested in the birth weight of babies from a hospital, well, it is the single baby to which is going to give you the information about that birth weight. So the observational unit is the baby. If you are interested in perhaps the sex distribution of a particular species of moth, again, it is the moth that is going to give you the info for the sex. So the moth is the observational unit. Now here's the tricky one coming up. Maybe you are interested in the number of colonies that form in a number of petri dishes, bacterial colonies. So if you're counting the number of colonies within a petri dish, the observational unit here is not an individual bacterium, but would be the petri dish, because it is the petri dish that is providing that info for the variable that you care about. Next up, we're going to talk about different types of studies and variables as they appear in those studies. So generally, studies are categorized as being experimental or observational. Those are the two that we're going to focus on. There are also surveys that's kind of considered another type of study, but in the world of biological sciences, we don't generally use those as much, so we're not going to focus on surveys as much. So let's talk about experimental studies and observational studies. But first, it's useful to consider variables that appear in these types of studies in a different way. So let's talk about study variables. A variable can wear a couple hats at a time. So a variable can be quantitative continuous, 
but also be explanatory. A variable can also be categorical and also be a response variable. So what do I mean by explanatory and response? I kind of think about this as like the x and the y variable, x, y, where an explanatory variable is like the independent variable or the input. And the response is like the output or the dependent variable that may be influenced by the explanatory variable. It's often easier to consider explanatory and response variables in the context of a study with an example. So let's talk about experimental studies and then we'll get to an example. So an experiment is generally a controlled environment in some way where researchers are imposing conditions on certain subjects. There are difficulties with experiments because they require lots of thoughtful foresight in their design, but there are benefits to experiments because when performed and designed appropriately, you may be able to discover a cause and effect relationship. And we'll discuss that further in the next video because a cause and effect relationship requires certain randomization principles, which we'll talk about in the future. So what is this control or the conditions that the researchers are imposing? Well, in an experiment, there are subjects. They could be people, they could be plants or dogs, and they are exposed to different treatments. Maybe one group of subjects will take the red pill and another group of subjects will take the blue pill. This allocation of subjects to these different treatments, i.e. the red pill or the blue pill, that is the control that researchers are imposing. And ideally that these individuals are randomly distributed to these two groups, red pill or blue pill. We'll talk about that in the future. But in general, an experiment is when subjects are manipulated in the sense that they are placed in certain groups in order to experience different treatments. Now, there are certain facets of experiments that you may have heard about. You may have heard of blinding, and we've got single blind, and we've got double blind. Where a, I just think this is kind of cool, fun stuff. A single blind experiment is when the participant or the subject does not know what they are being exposed to. So they don't know, are, am I taking the red pill or am I taking the blue pill? It's all a mystery. But what's different with a double blind study? That is when the treatment is kept secret from the participant and the administrator of that treatment. So if there's a person who is giving the subject the blue pill or the red pill, they also don't know what kind of pill it is either. So double blind is when both parties are kind of kept in the dark. Now, why might a double blind study be used? A double blind study has benefits in that it will help minimize any preconceived notions on how a subject may think they should behave or act or respond to the treatment. The power of suggestion can be quite strong. It's really impressive, actually. If the individual who is providing the treatment also does not know, they are also unable to provide nonverbal cues as to what the treatment is. 
because we as humans are very perceptive to not only the words that we hear, but to body language and all sorts of nonverbal cues that could perhaps hint at what the treatment is. And so a double blind study has benefits in that it will minimize the bias um, that a participant will change their response inadvertently to a particular treatment. Also, this is a good segue into placebos. You may have heard of placebos before too. A placebo is, it looks, it tastes, it sounds like the real deal, but it is not the real deal. So this is generally, sometimes people call this the sugar pill, but generally if it was a pill, it'd probably have some inert substance. Um, or if it's an injection, maybe it's a saline injection. And most people have probably heard of the placebo effect, where even people who have been provided placebos have purported to experience a response from that inert substance. Perhaps like they, re they felt relief from a headache, or they got relief from being seasick or other wound pain. I think there's called the nocebo effect, where individuals who have been given placebos have even experienced the side effects of the actual drug, but they've been given an inert substance. And people have been reported to, you know, experience like hives or spike a temperature, even though they've been given an, an inert substance. So I think that's pretty interesting as well. Here I have an excerpt from our textbook that outlines briefly the details of an experiment in which volunteers were randomly assigned to a treatment group or a control group that took a vaccine or a placebo for the common cold. And these were self-reported and compared to the number of colds they had in the current year compared to a previous year. The group that was exposed to the vaccine had a 70% reduction on average. And that seems pretty convincing until you look at the placebo group and they had a 69% reduction in uh, the number of colds. Without this placebo group or control group, you wouldn't have any sort of comparison between how effective this vaccine supposedly was. So often the placebo or the control group can serve as a baseline for the active ingredient group, i.e. the vaccine here. Now there could be difficulties in this study such as these are self-reported. Um, if people knew they were in the placebo group or the vaccine group, they might behave a little differently in their behaviors. Um, so there are a lot of things to consider in the design of a study, but a placebo group can be used as a baseline to compare the other treatment groups too. And so I wanna look at another example here to illustrate experimental design and discuss study variables in the context of that experiment. So here we've got topiramate, which is a treatment for alcohol dependence in which researchers conducted a 14 week trial of men and women of a particular age group who have been diagnosed with alcohol dependence. They did a double blind randomized placebo controlled experiment in which the subjects were either given the topiramate or a placebo, along with the a weekly compliance enhancement intervention meeting. Now, how are they going to measure if this topiramate is effective? Since they're dealing with alcohol dependence, they are going to probably need to know how often uh, alcohol was consumed in a heavy or abusive manner. So that is what they use as 
their variable is the self-reported percentage of heavy drinking days. So I've got a swath of questions here in which we're going to consider some of these key words, such as placebo controlled. Well, that means that not only were they providing a drug with an active ingredient, the 300 milligrams of topiramate, but they've also got a placebo, right? That's an inert substance. So a group of subjects was given the real deal and a group of subjects was given an inert substance. What does it mean to be double blind? Why do you think it's necessary for this experiment to be double blind? Well, to be double blind means that the individuals who were providing the placebo or drug did not know what they were administering. And also the individuals who were receiving did not know. So that could be very useful. So that way the individuals in the study do not alter their behavior in any way to meet some sort of expected response. What does it mean for this experiment to be randomized? Well, that means that these individuals, there were 371 total. They were allocated to the placebo group or to the topiramate group in a random fashion. So they didn't put all the men in the placebo group and all the women in the topiramate group that would have some bias to it, right? So they've got a mixture of individuals across both their treatment groups. What is the population for which the study applies? Now we haven't really discussed that yet, but we can talk about there were 371 people in the study, but though that composes the sample, the population would be all men and women in this age group diagnosed with alcohol dependence. The sample would be the 371 men and women diagnosed with alcohol dependence in this group. All right, our last two questions. What is the response variable and what are the treatments? Well, the response variable is the thing you, you ultimately care about here. So that would be the self-reported percentage of heavy drinking days. And the treatments were the 300 milligrams of topiramate and the placebo. So now we're going to talk about observational studies. So in an experiment, there is some manipulation of conditions. But in an observational study, the researchers are passive observers and they're not manipulating the environment in any way. So for instance, a study conducted in Finland found that people who were married in midlife were less likely to develop cognitive impairment later in life. This describes an observational study. It's common for someone who may not be um, experienced in study design and what that implies, it'd be easy for someone to incorrectly conclude that getting married in midlife may prevent cognitive impairment later in life, but that is not the case with an observational study. Even though this link was discovered, because it's observational, we don't know all sorts of other factors that may be involved. Information was collected. People were not put into groups right? There wasn't a group of people who got married and people who did not get married. They were not assigned to those groups. People sort of naturally existed in those groups and were tracked over time and information was still collected, but individuals were not manipulated.
So there's a lot of other factors that go into studies, particularly observational studies, that may not be accounted for. Those are called confounding variables. A confounding variable sometimes has different names and sometimes they imply different things, but the general idea behind a confounding variable is that it is an explanatory variable that affects the response variable, but usually is not directly kept track of. So here's a quick example. Suppose you are researching whether the lack of exercise leads to weight gain. Here, the independent variable would be exercise amount. The dependent variable would be weight gain. But aren't there other confounding variables, other explanatory variables that can contribute to one's weight? I'm sure you can list many of them. Sleep, genetics, stress, diet, all these other variables that can contribute to one's weight. But if they're not explicitly kept track of, then they would be confounding the results. I've got an example here from our textbook in which 1,718 people over the age of 65 living in North Carolina. Researchers found that those who attended religious services regularly were more likely to have strong immune systems than those who did not, determined by some objective measure of a protein in the blood. Does that mean that attending religious services improves one's health? Why or why not? Is this an experiment? Or is this an observational study? Because it's observational, people were naturally in the groups that they are in. They either attend religious services regularly or they don't. They were not assigned to those groups. So this is a correlation that was observed, but it does not mean that if you attend religious services, that will improve your health. There is no cause and effect that can happen there in an observational study. Observational studies are sometimes the only type of study you can do, but they do have uh, certain difficulties. They do not have this allocation of individuals to groups or treatments. But hopefully observational studies do include random sampling, so that way there is some randomization incorporated into the study to reduce selection bias. We'll talk about that more in the next video. As mentioned previously, experiments do have the potential to suss out a cause and effect relationship if performed correctly, but observational studies do not. And this is because of the confounding variables that are uncontrolled that are rampant in observational studies. So in observational studies, if uh, there is some trend or pattern that is observed, generally you want to think about these words, uh, correlation, association, or relationships, things like that. But to the untrained individual, especially in popular media, sometimes these words are incorrectly translated as cause and effect, and that's incorrect. So beware. These words do not mean cause and effect. It just means that a relationship was observed. Let's look at an example of when someone interprets correlation as causation incorrectly. Okay, sleeping with one's shoes on is strongly correlated with waking up with a headache. Therefore, sleeping with your shoes on causes a headache. That's definitely not true, right? Where a more reasonable explanation for this would be that there's a third factor in play, i.e. maybe going to bed intoxicated has led you to forget that you are wearing your shoes. So here, correlation and causation, not the same thing, certainly. What about this example? 
Here's another quickie example of an incorrect inference of causation from correlation. As ice cream sales increase, so does the rate of drowning deaths. Therefore, ice cream consumption causes drowning. Certainly this is not the case and that there is a missing link here of temperature because as temperature goes up, generally so do water-based activities and ice cream consumption. So again, incorrect inference of cause and effect when only a correlation was observed. So as mentioned, observational studies do not allow for cause and effect relationships to be discovered, only correlation. But it doesn't make observational studies bad because observing that relationship can still be valuable. There are ways to account for confounding variables in pretty advanced uh, techniques far beyond the scope of our class. And as mentioned, there is value in observing a correlation and causation is not always the object. Lastly here, I want to talk a little bit about populations and samples and some details about both of those where and kind of bring it all back into this idea of the discipline of statistics where generally statistics is going to rear its head when you are researching a population and there's something particular or things that are particular that you're interested in that population where the population is everyone or everything that your question applies to. Now, generally you don't have access to an entire population. Maybe you want to study humpback whales and their migration patterns. Well, you're not going to be able to observe every single humpback whale in existence, but you may be able to monitor a sample of humpback whales. So a sample is a subset of the population that is available for study or selected to study. Once you have a sample, then you would collect data or information from the individuals or the observational units in your sample. So data is often considered plural and a datum is a single observation. Sometimes I misspeak, but I'm a human as well. So this whole process, uh, research question, developing your population, collecting info from a sample, this all is embodied in the discipline of statistics, where you are collecting, designing studies, organizing data so that it can be analyzed and presented. Descriptive statistics is generally a summary of data where you are summarizing uh, a lot of info in a brief statement or statements. Inferential statistics is taking those descriptive statistics and drawing conclusions about the future or drawing conclusions beyond the sample based on what was previously observed. And we'll talk about more of that in the future. So population, samples, there are distinctions between them and there are characteristics of both of them that are similar but distinctly different. For instance, a population has qualities that we generally would call parameters. For instance, you might have the average weight of a humpback whale. And that would apply to the population. We don't generally know population parameters because no one is capable of weighing every humpback whale in existence. But this might be a quality that you're interested in. What is the average weight of adult humpback whales? Here's another parameter that Deserve its own, deserves its own day of discussion, which is called standard deviation. We will get there. And these are Greek letters. 
This is the Greek letter mu. It's like a fancy M with a handle. This is the Greek letter sigma. We will discuss these in more detail in a week or so. So here is another example where mu is a parameter and it generally represents an average. So in this example, mu is representing the average weight of stellar sea lion pups off the north coast of California. Can you actually determine the weights of the entire pup population? Of course not. And so a parameter is generally representing the population of interest and is not a tangible value. You usually cannot apply a value to a parameter because a parameter applies to a population, which is usually unattainable. Let's contrast that with a statistic. If you are studying a population, you want to collect a sample and then info from that sample. Summarized info from the sample are called statistics. So here is the equivalent measure an average or mean standard deviation, but it would apply to a sample. And these are generally represented with just regular letters. Sometimes we put little hats or bars on top of them to remind us that they apply to samples. We call this Y with a bar. Looking back at our sea, sea lion pups, Y bar may represent the average weight of a sample of 40 or 50 or 18 stellar pups that were collected off the north coast of California. Since the purpose of collecting a sample is to get info from that sample in relation to the per variable you care about, yes, if you collected the sample of sea lion pups, hopefully you're weighing them because that's kind of your whole purpose. So a sample statistic does have a value attributed to it. And here is what these stellar sea lines look like. Um, some size differentiation here between a pup. It looks like a female and a male. They're so cute. Okay, I'm gonna give you two related scenarios and you tell me which one is which. The debt of all 2018 HSU graduates versus the debt of all grads that responded to the survey. The top one must be population, and the bottom one must be the sample. All the individuals that apply to your study, but you're not gonna be able to have access to every single graduate, most likely, but you will be able to have access to those who responded to your survey. Here is another population, a uh, little goofy one. Maybe you know who these are. These are the wonderful Simpsons. And we've got a little of everyone in here, just about. There's Mrs. Krabappel. There's Nelson, Maud, Ghost of Maud, <laughs> Mole Man. Okay, so if this is a population, then those who are in this box could be a potential sample. And here's another sample. And here's another one. And here's another one. Now, the idea of sampling, which we'll talk about more in the next video, is to learn about the population. I think we can agree that this sample would be different from this sample. They're different, right? And suppose you were measuring a, or counting a variable, maybe like height. I know these are fictitious characters, but if you got the average height from sample one and sample two, they would be different. Is the sample mean from this sample wrong? Or is the sample mean from this sample wrong? If they were both representative samples of this population, and we know they're different from each other, is one of them correct and the other incorrect? A big topic that we will unravel over time is that 
a sample statistic varies across samples and it's what is called sampling error. And so we'll talk about that in the next session a little bit more, but because that is a really big topic that we will um, thoroughly discuss throughout the semester. So that's the end of this PowerPoint voiceover video. It is available to you on Canvas. The next video, we're going to do another PowerPoint, probably the last one, and we're going to talk about sampling and statistical inference. In the meantime, I recommend that you start the first two Canvas quizzes. The first one is very basic based on the syllabus, um, but the second quiz is on the information discussed in this PowerPoint. Thank you all.